It's just past midwinter, but strong winds from the south brought heavy rains, and much of the snow melted. It hasn't happened all at once, but in stages over several weeks, and I have, bit by bit, been able to get ever further back into the hidden valley. My quest to get a sense of the biodiversity of this nearly undisturbed little world continues. But as I go, I am struck by the beauty of this place. Even here, in the heart of winter, there is so much color, so much complexity, so much magnificent beauty. And though the forest is often as silent as a night without a breath, if one can be still and silent and patient, one can see it come to life. I knew there was a porcupine nearby when I saw the spore of its presence scarring trees on young poplar clones. The porcupine had used its powerful teeth to whittle away the outer bark to get at the nutritious cambium beneath. I've been watching him for a while now, and though I have been still as a stone for an hour, he still knows I'm here, and every now and then he glances toward me to see what I am up to. I don't think he's exactly afraid. Porcupines aren't afraid of much to my knowledge except for mountain lions, which are well adept at getting at their meaty bodies despite their quills, but he is cautious as every wise animal is. I bid the porcupine farewell and good luck, and continue my ascent up the ridge to the highest point on the west side of the valley. Here, a natural break in the trees may afford video capture of birds in flight, and I've gotten lucky as I've spotted activity ahead in the trees. The spruce grouse may be common, but it's a marvelous little creature. During the mating season, the cocks attract mates by beating their wings faster than the speed of sound, creating a thumping sound that carries for at least a quarter mile, even through the Stens forest. And they have broad, ornate tails that they can fan in the manner of a peacock. But here this grouse is merely passing a windy day in the safety of the crotch of a tree between feeding times. While the condensed version of time portrayed in this video can give the impression that wildlife photography is all action, the truth is a lot of it is waiting and waiting and waiting. Watching the woods and sky and listening for any signs of activity and occasionally shifting my position around this old birch to do my best to keep the strong wind off my back. I'm wearing a wind and water resistant, heavily insulated coat and hat, but despite them, the icy wind of this February day still manages to penetrate and chill me when and where it can. All the while, the forest carries on its timeless, all-important rituals, the passage and purification of water, the play of ice and sunlight, The sleep of old trees and new growth, awaiting the dawn of spring. And then suddenly, I hear the calling of ravens echoing between the ridges. There is little time to react and much to do, 
I jump up and set the camera for manual focus at infinity. Lock the focus and run to the clearing. And there they are. The Raven is one of the most intelligent creatures on Earth. They are capable of using tools and can make more vocalizations than any other creature in the world excepting humans. Behavior scientists have realized there is a pattern in these vocalizations, a language, and much effort has been put in recent years toward deciphering it, and progress has been made. Some of the words of the Raven language are becoming known. After the Ravens pass, I realize the sun is westering. The valley is growing colder. When I first came here, it was 27 degrees Fahrenheit. It's perhaps half that now. I decide to head down into the valley. It will be colder, but it's a chance to get my blood flowing. Once I get down there, I decide to make my way to the river that courses the center of this valley and see if there I can find more of winter's subtle beauties. I've been carrying a medium-sized pack with about 30 pounds of photographic gear, as well as food and water, a first aid kit, lens cleaning kit, and a few other necessities that I might need for an entire day in a cold forest. But the pack is heavy, and I won't be moving more than a couple more miles from this position, so I decide to leave it beside a log. But near the brook, a disturbance in the snow catches my eyes. Tracks. They are closely set and dense. At first I think perhaps it is the movement of a beaver emerging from the stream. I know they've been beginning to work in this area. It's hard to be certain because the tracks are mostly melted, and when tracks melt, they spread out and the definition loses detail. But I continue to study the tracks moving upward toward their origin, and spot the heart shape in a pair of points that indicate this was a pair of deer. In fact, two deer, of medium to small size, moving in a walking calm gait in a direct register pattern which further enlarged the tracks. Bucks rarely move together at this time of year. These are the tracks of either a doe and her yearling, or perhaps a pair of does, most likely a family unit. I press on from the side of the tracks, intending to scout the land for more spore and see if there has been activity of other wildlife in the area, but I keep getting lost in the beauty of this riparian environment, pausing everywhere to stop and take pictures. The sun is falling further into the west though. It will be dark in under two hours. All the forest here in the depths of the valley is deep in winter's silent heart. There is not a sound save the breeze soughing through the trees. With the last light of the sun now upon me, I decide to take up position beside an old log, allowing myself to blend in with the standing trees and overturned detritus all around me. Animals are not good at spotting visual gestalts, and typically simply by doing this, I can disappear into the landscape, and after a while, if there are animals to be seen, they will put in an appearance. I know the odds are slim though. The only spore that I've seen down here at this time has been that of that pair of moving deer, and it's old spore. It's unlikely they're going to come back anytime quickly. I'm aware a pack of coyotes and at least one black bear lives in this area, but the coyotes have been silent, and the black bear would be hibernating about now. In the trees, though, I catch movement. The flitting of black cap finches and a pileated woodpecker that puts in an appearance just for an instant. And in the last remnant of the waning light, everywhere I turn is beauty. When there are only minutes before dark, I decide it's best to get moving. A moon will rise tonight, but here in the dark of the valley, I won't benefit from it much. I'm not afraid of the forest at night, 
The forest to me is an old friend. It's where I've lived most of my life. But the winter wood with new ice can be a perilous place, fraught with slippery ice and various tripping hazards and things to run into. So in the twilight I get moving, knowing that I will not be out of the wood till well after dark. But one last magical moment makes me glad that I was not able to get out of the forest before full dark. The moon is risen, its light slipping between the boughs of the trees, and it falls beside this trailside brook, a tributary leading down to the larger river that flows through the middle of the hidden valley. And moonlight scintillates upon the snow, sparkling silver and gold, framed by moon shadows of the trees.